<sighs> Hi y'all, Kraken Latte here. Welcome to the first step in this series on building your alt army. In step one here, we're going to cover what I believe to be the most important step, mental preparation. If you can't get past this one, then the rest of the process will not be fun for you. So grab a snack and your thinking cap and let's dig in. First, let's start with the most obvious question. Why would you want multiple alts? Well, there's many reasons for this, as well as various pros and cons, which I've actually already covered in my pros and cons of alt armies video. Check that one out if you want to dig a little deeper on that specific topic, linked down below in the description and in a pin. But for now, let's look at it with these reasons. Reason A. Collectibles such as mounts and transmog can be obtained much faster. Just think about how many dries you could have on Invincible or some other mount each week. Reason B, you'll have access to multiple classes. If you've raided at all, you'll know how often classes get changed, buffed, or nerfed, and your guild may ask you to change classes or even roles. If you've already got every class at least leveled, then this won't be an issue. And reason C, because you want to. This is just as legit as any reason in my book. I tie this into my reasoning for roleplay. I'm an RPer and I have a lot of characters. There's just something special to me about having your RP character physically in the game and then being able to play them whenever you want to. Let's assume you'll have a mix of these reasons, plus others I'm sure, and now touch on something I find to be really important. Letting go of your need for self-restraint. You may not have this issue, but I did, so let's address it. If you've ever had the sudden desire to make a class or race combo that struck your fancy, and then told yourself no for some reason or another, it's time to let go of that. You can't make an alt army if you won't let yourself make alts. Think of this as impulse shopping. Make a list and let your wants guide you. Orc mage? That'd be cool. Undead rogue? Hmm, sure, why not. Taran hunter? Huh, that sounds neat. What about that class or race you've always wanted to play, even if you had no real reason for wanting it? You know what? Make it anyways. Who says you can't? If you want to make an alt army, you'll just have to accept that it's okay to have lots of alts. In fact, it is okay to have more than one class, race, or race class combo. This was a big one for me. Having more than one class of the same race just irked me for some reason for the longest time. But you know what? I got over it, and now I love them all. You don't even have to take it seriously. Why not make something you think is derpy or funny? You just might fall in love with them. My main? A human paladin? Yeah, I made him because of a joke. And now, I wouldn't trade him for anything. Let's move on to the next part. Does the thought of upkeep stress you out? Remind yourself what you want them for. You don't have to do everything on every alt. Here's an example. Are you a raider? Then only raid gear the specific characters you're actually going to raid with. Gear gets outmoded almost every patch, and there's always ways to get caught up. If it's not gear, then what upkeep is it you're worrying about anyways? You likely don't have to do anything beyond what you plan to use them for. It's not required. What if you're just an RPer or a collector like me? Guess what I do with them? Almost nothing beyond RPing and collecting. I'll get far more specific on details and upkeep in another video, so let's not worry too much about that right now. Just know that you only need to do enough for them to be usable for your chosen purpose. No more is needed unless you want to. That's how burnout starts. Alright, I think I've prattled on long enough about that. I'll sum it up with this. It is okay to have an alt army, no matter what you want them for. In the next video, I'll cover how to actually start putting together an alt army, but I wanted to give you some encouragement and have you get mentally prepared for something the community seems to often poke fun at for some reason. So with that said, I leave you with a challenge to give you some direction for the next step. I dare you to at least write down one of each class, that's 12, currently available in the game. Attach a race to it that you think is cool. Name it and then save that list. I don't care what faction it's for, though I recommend you pick just one to work with for now. 
I'll keep that on hand, and then in part two, I'll show you exactly what to do with it. In part one, we talked about getting mentally prepared. I also gave you a bit of homework. Do you have your list of alts? We're going to use that list now, so pull it out and get your creative brain on. If you don't have a list, that's okay. You can start one right now. Here's what I recommend for a strong starting point. At least one of each class on the faction of your choice. Of course, you can make whatever classes you want, but why do I recommend at least one of each? Well, you'll have playstyle variety, which is great for players who get bored easy like me. You'll also get access to all gear and weapon types for Mog, including class-specific stuff like old raid tier or PvP sets. And you'll have access to any class-specific content like the Legion class halls, the mounts, or some quests. On top of that, every class has something useful about them, like lockpicking on rogues, which could be handy in your arsenal. Whatever the case, it's time to make them. For this part, I highly recommend you make them all in one faction to start with, and all on one server. Here's why. You can have all 50 characters on one server now. It becomes real easy if you have all your alts of the same faction on the same server. So, having a horde all together, for example. This lets you share tradable gear, materials, gold, craftables, bags, and anything like that across all those characters. And this makes saving gold a snap. I want to stress too, to choose a server you think you'll be happy on. Try to pick a forever home. Test out servers for a bit if you have to. You don't want to pick up and transfer a bunch of alts later, trust me. I've done it and I don't want to do it again. And you don't want to be forced to remake those characters either. Leveling may be faster these days, but alts are a long-term investment. It's best to do this with some permanence in mind. Listed in the description below are some websites that I've used in the past to help make these decisions. Now, once you've picked your server, make all those alts from your list. Something I did to help keep track was organize my characters by class and armor type in the roster. You don't have to do this, but I find it easy to hop on classes I need without really looking at them this way. Are you having trouble naming characters and don't want to name them something silly? Then check out this site fantasynamegenerators.com. They even have wonderful Warcraft ones, which I find super awesome. Plus, there's a gazillion other generators there too, in case you want something else. Before we move on, I want to point out that making characters strictly for their class is just a very basic method to get you started. If you're a player who's already way beyond this, like me, I'll be doing another video on how I create my characters. It's very RP-focused though, so it'll be a part of the Building RP Characters series. But a lot of love goes into the brainstorming process for me, so I hope you'll enjoy that when it comes out in the future. At any rate, let's continue here first. So you've made your new characters, all of the same faction, all on the same server. My next tip for you is to put them in your own personal guild. Thanks to being all of the same faction on the same server, you can do this. If you don't already have one, you'll need to make one. So grab some friends to help, or pay some random people and get started. You'll either need to make a second account or have someone else to invite all your characters, but once that's done, it's done. Now, why do I recommend the personal guild for your alt army? This is the best way to share all your stuff across alts, and this is what I do. I store items I find useful in the guild bank, as well as all my gold. You can also use the guild to look at professions or look up alts through the roster to check levels or something else. Since it's your guild, you can also place notes on them too, like gear spec or item level. Plus, you can whip it out on the fly as a portable bank. If you'd like to see what kind of items I find useful enough to keep in my own guild bank, I've done a couple of videos on that already. The link for those is in the description and in a pin. I also recommend you start a list of your alts so you can keep track of them. You can put any info you find helpful within it. This isn't required, but I find it super useful. Here's a look at mine. You can put this list wherever, of course, but Discord has been working great for me to give you an idea. I like that it has different emojis and icons to help differentiate things I need to know. So, if you've kept up so far, now you'll have chosen your forever server, made your first slew of alts, and got them all into the same guild. Nice. You've accomplished a healthy first step into this process. 
I'd say that is enough to keep you busy for now until the next step. Certainly feel free to add as many characters to your new guild as you want. I'll show you what to do with them next in part 3. Last time, we went over picking your server, making your alts, and getting them into a personal guild. Now that you've got that done, it's time we look at how to tackle your fresh army. Now, we are at the stage that more often than not will break the weak will. That's why this step is called the hurdle. See all those alts you just made? If you really want to bring them to their full potential and have access to all content in the game, you have to level them. Lucky for you, leveling is oodles faster after the squish hit, so this isn't nearly as monumental as it used to be. Hold your horses for a moment though, not everything has to be about speed. This is when you need to take a step back and examine what kind of person you are. Are you the go 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 gotta go fast player? Or do you like to just stop and eat the roses? I'd take this seriously if I were you. Leveling the wrong way according to your personality will instantly cause burnout and that's not why you want an alt army. So I recommend you set goals and priorities. Are you planning on raiding in the next tier with some of these alts? Do you want to grind the next PvP season? If you have any specific events or dates tied to certain alts, then you should focus on those first to alleviate that stress. If you have no time constraints, then you can choose your own pace. In this case, set milestones for yourself like two alts to level 50 each week or something you know you can handle. You also want to note down any twinks that you may want so you don't accidentally overlevel them. That's the fancy word for stopping XP gains on any of your characters. It's certainly not required, but it can have its uses. Notice I said level 50? The 1 to 50 bracket is a cakewalk compared to the 50 to 60 span right now, so unless you desperately want into Shadowlands content on every single alt right now, I'd hold off for whenever we get flying. That'll make it much easier. More on the milestones, however, perhaps the thought of getting each character to level 50 wears you out. Then take smaller chunks. Level in 5s or 10s and then take a break. Level a different alt to keep from burnout of a single class. Slow progress is better than no progress, and by no means do you have to level each one to max in one go. To add to this, there are certainly ways you can liven things up a bit. Perhaps try leveling through an expansion you don't remember well or never even tried. Maybe make it a goal to level one of each armor type through each expansion. That's a good way to get a bunch of transmog you don't know. Doing this can also get you the lore master achievement, so do it while you have to level all these alts. I do also have a video going over different ways to spice up leveling. It's an older video, but the tips in it are not expansion specific, so you may still find it useful. That's linked down in the description and in a pin. If you've not quested much and only ever spammed dungeons, then perhaps take this time to check out the other major half of WoW's content. There are an insane amount of quests in the game, and I bet you you haven't read most of them. There are a lot of engaging stories and deep lore facts only found via quests, so I'd encourage you to get immersed. Don't be shy, this is an MMORPG after all. I'm sure even after that pep talk though, there's still a portion of you who just want to get this leveling hurdle out of the way as quickly as possible. Lucky for you, I'm working on new leveling guides as we speak. Hours and hours have already gone into testing, so I'm hoping to have those out soon. When they're finished, they'll be linked in the description and in a pin. So that's pretty much this step in a nutshell. Leveling your alts. That may not sound like much, but it is the most monumental task out of everything you'll have to do for these characters. So that's why it's important to go easy on yourself. Enjoy it. Figure out how to make it fun. This is for you after all, right? I believe in you. It's time to dig in and get these alts leveled. Whether you do that now or wait until my guides come out, I'll show you what to do with them next in part four. In part three, we talked about leveling your alt army. This time, we're going to look at some things that you can do to make sure each of your characters are useful based on a simple concept I call self-sustainability. Now, I want you to understand that none of this is required for you as it really depends on what you plan to use your alts for. So we'll go over my recommendations based on what I do. So, here's this step's big topic. Professions. You may have seen this one coming, but even if you didn't, let's take a look. 
If you followed my recommendation from part 1 and made at least 12 alts, regardless of what class they are, then you actually have enough characters to have every profession available. That's right, all of them. Buckle up, Buttercup. So here's that list. Blacksmithing, leatherworking, tailoring, enchanting, jewel crafting, inscription, engineering, and alchemy. Those are the primary crafting professions. Here are the primary gathering professions, mining, herbalism, and skinning. I'm sure you noticed that engineering and alchemy are starred. I'll get to that in a minute. Each of your alts can know up to two professions at any time, be it crafting and gathering, two gathering, or two crafting. On top of that, they can learn all three secondary professions, which are fishing, cooking, and archaeology. Now here's what I recommend you do with this. Choose eight of your alts that you feel would be best able to use each of the primary crafting professions. I highly recommend you consider armor type and a playstyle as well, and match those up. For example, blacksmithing would be best utilized on a paladin, warrior, or death knight since those are the plate-wearing classes. There are actually a good portion of bind on pickup items that you can craft with the armor-based professions, which means you literally can't use what you craft if you're the wrong armor type. This also means that leatherworking should go on a male or leather wearer, and tailoring on any clothy. When those three are assigned, now it's time to choose who gets the rest of the crafting professions. If you're indecisive, you may also want to look at racials. Some races get boosts and bonuses with certain professions, even if minor. Blood Elves, for example, get a little enchanting bonus. If you want me to do a video covering all the profession-related racials, let me know in the comments. Otherwise, let's move on. Once you've assigned all eight primary crafting professions, now it's time to assign the gathering ones. I highly recommend that you pair each gathering profession with the crafting one that they feed, as it just makes things easier. So. That would look like this. Mining with blacksmithing, engineering, and jewel crafting, herbalism with alchemy and inscription, skinning with leatherworking, and then tailoring and enchanting can go together. These two are special since cloth can be gathered by anyone regardless of profession, and enchanting is its own gathering source. So since those two are standalones and also can feed each other, as they both often use cloth and enchanting materials, they play nice on the same character. If you want to do double crafters or double gatherers and go against this list, that's totally up to you, but I would save that for extra characters beyond your first 10. Now, why am I saying beyond 10? Didn't I say 8? Well, remember how I had alchemy and engineering starred? Those two are unique because they have something called masteries. If you go to the profession trainer in Stormwind or Orgrimmar, the one that teaches you vanilla and cataclysm, you'll be able to pick up a quest to learn a mastery. You won't see this quest until you've leveled the vanilla bracket of your profession, but once you do, you can get this quest. For the masteries, alchemy has potion, elixirs, and transmutations, while engineering has goblin and gnomish. Here's how they work. The alchemy ones will allow any craft of its matching name to proc in multiples when crafted if it is from Mists of Pandaria and older. So, if you choose the Potion Mastery, and any potion that has the name Potion, we'll have a chance to proc much like the new ones do with the ranking system from Legion and BFA. So, like my favorite Potion of Deep Holm, can proc if I make sure to craft it on my Potion Master. For Engineering, it's a little different. You're simply able to learn different recipes based on the one you chose. So if you choose Goblin, you can make recipes special to that mastery, much like the Caparium Rocket Mount, but not the Gnomish stuff like the Geosynchronous Mount. The catch is that you can only learn one mastery. So if you chose Potions on your Alchemist and Goblin on your Engineer, you have to delete that mastery in order to learn the other on the same character. That will get expensive real quick, and guess what? Any recipes you learn specific to that mastery will be unlearned. So, I recommend you have three alchemists and two engineers to have all of these covered. Guess what? That works out to 11 professions, since it's three more beyond the initial eight. But you only need to choose 10, since tailoring and enchanting will be on the same character. So, your list, if you've been following along, should look like this. 
blacksmithing and mining together on a plateware, leatherworking and skinning together on a male or leatherware, tailoring and enchanting together on a clothware, jewel crafting and mining together, inscription and herbalism together, goblin engineering and mining together, gnomish engineering and mining together, potion alchemy and herbalism together, elixir alchemy and herbalism together, and transmutation alchemy with herbalism or mining. I'm sure you just noticed that I have mining also listed with the transmutation alchemist. This is totally optional for you, but since transmutations often deal with ore and bars from mining, such as the wonderful living steel from Pandaria, that's what I do with my transmuters. Does that mean living steel can proc? Oh yes. Yes it does. So that's the primary professions all covered, but we're not done yet. We can't forget about the secondary professions. I recommend you have all of your characters learn all three. Yes, you heard me right. All of the secondary professions. Cooking, fishing, and archaeology. It can be useful for many reasons, but here's the biggest one. World quests. Those wonderful little mini quests that started in Legion have profession-related ones, including those for secondary professions. Remember bacon? That comes from a world quest and you have to have cooking in order to see it. I made a lot of gold off this one alone back in Legion when it was live. Bacon used to average about 200 gold on my servers, and I had about 30-ish alts at the time. The world quest could give upwards of 10 bacon, so yeah, you do the math. Now don't stress. While you do need to level all 11 primary professions from your list, you do not need to level all of these secondaries across all of your alts. Though I do recommend you at least learn the base for each expansion, so that way you have access to whatever that expansion offers. So, just pick two characters who you feel like you'd play often. One to have the maxed cooking and fishing, and then the other to have the maxed archaeology. Cooking and fishing can go on anyone you want, and they go together quite well. But you should level archaeology on one of your alchemists. The Vial of the Sands Mount, that awesome two-person dragon mount, is an alchemy recipe that you learn from doing Tolvir digs. It has a very low chance to come out of the canopic jar solves. You know what the catch is? The recipe itself is bind on pickup, which means you must be an alchemist and an archaeologist to learn it. So pick one of your three alchemists and they'll be your Indiana Jones. Mine's a druid in case you're curious. And here's what my list looks like in this case. Oh, and to my knowledge, it doesn't matter what mastery your alchemist has, so any of them are fine. Phew, that's a lot of work now, isn't it? See why I said to make a character list in part two? Information like this certainly needs to be in it so you don't forget who has what. Now, if you hadn't guessed, these are set up to be permanent. Do you really want to have to redo all this again in the future? I sure don't. I've done this three times already and had to say enough was enough. I lost the vial of the sands recipe I had because of it, and I've yet to get it again. Please, please, please pick a permanent holder of these professions. Your future self will thank you. All right, I think that's enough for one step. I was going to add in a bit more, but I think I'll scoot that topic to part five since it isn't entirely profession related. For now, think hard on who gets what and make sure you're happy with the decisions. I've put a link to the guides that I use to level my own professions in the description and in a pin, which is wowprofessions.com. They have farming guides too, as well as approximate materials needed to level, so they've been super handy and I highly recommend them. So in part four, we covered the intense topic of getting all the professions covered, as well as the special ones with masteries, across your new alt army. That can be done whether you've leveled them or not, and this topic is like that as well. I had a tough time coining the term for this topic, so we'll call it foundational maintenance. To put it simply, this topic is just making a checklist for yourself on what you need to do on every single alt. I don't mean leveling or quests, I mean quality of life, simple type things that don't require a lot of effort. So let's look at my list and you'll see what I'm talking about. Alright, so first let's dig into the super simple stuff. Bags, banks, and void storage. 
If I know I'm going to keep a character, the first thing I do is go grab some big bags and put them on. If you've played WoW for longer than a few hours, then you know how frustrating it can be to constantly hit max inventory space. In this case, I like the 30 slot bags, which come in three options of Hexweave, Deep Sea, and Shrouded Cloth, so I just buy whatever is cheapest at the time. Then I'll mosey on over to the bank and open up all seven bank slots and put 30 slot bags into those too. Total, you'll need 11 bags. Four for you and seven for the bank. And don't forget to unlock the materials tab too. After that, I go have a chat with our ethereal friends and open up the void storage. Yes, I do use this still as it's great for storing keepsake items that you don't need cluttering up your bank. Void storage can hold anything that's not stackable or labeled as unique, so long as it's soulbound. This even includes some of the old legendaries. With that out of the way, now we need equipment. I don't mean gear, I mean mount equipment and items we'll keep in our bags. My favorite mount equipment is the comfortable Rider's Barding. This prevents you from being dazed and dismounted by mobs, which is a must-have for me since I find that feature extremely unwanted. Now as for what I keep in my bags, I have a few things to talk about. First, Goblin Gliders. I don't care what level I am, every alt has these and I even put them on my bars for quick access. You don't want to die to uh, fall damage, do you? That's just embarrassing. I also have Deep Home Potions. These are like a second instant hearth and can be used once you're level 31. Obviously mages don't need these, but every other alt I have does. Ultimate Gnomish Army Knife. This only goes on my main crafting profession holders because this little item subs in for every crazy tool that you need, including the enchanting rod, the jewel crafting chest, blacksmithing hammer, arc light spanner, and a lot more. It covers all of them. Thermal Anvil. I keep this on miners, blacksmiths, engineers, and jewel crafters. This item is a portable anvil which doubles as a forge for smelting. Super handy for smelting on the fly. I'm sure you see my hearthstones in here too. I make sure to get both the garrison hearth and the Dalaran hearth on all my alts, both of which are super easy to get. And as a side tip, you can actually delete your regular hearth if you have any of the hearthstone toys, because these do the same thing even if you delete the physical hearthstone itself. So that's one more bag slot you can have. For the garrison hearth, you have to open your garrison, but that takes like 10 minutes or less. To get it, you don't have to do the expansion intro, so you can just hop over to your garrison area and find Velen or Thrall down by the shore where your shipyard goes, and then begin the quests. Just a few quests in and you'll have it, though I do recommend getting the garrison itself in shape. I'll have a video on how to do all that later. And then for the Dalaran Hearth, you can either do the little intro, skipping the scenario of course, or just head straight there with the Azuna portal. You have to be higher level to do that last part though. If you've done the intro and you don't have that stone for some reason, go talk to the innkeeper in the Ledgerman and ask for a new one. You can technically do this on a low level who hasn't done the intro too, but your hearthstone won't work until you do or hit level 50. It's a little silly. And of course, the Flight Master's Whistle. This thing is nice if you're doing any world content in Legion or BFA. You can get one when you activate the world quests in Legion or BFA, which you should also do, both of those, once you hit level 50. Getting back down to basics with equipment, I make sure each alt has a shirt and a tabard equipped even if I mog them invisible. I'm prone to making random mog sets on the fly and I want to have all options available since you can mog these slots as well. Gotta be prepared, you know. You should also make sure you have the highest riding license for your level. At level 40, you can have all of them, including max flying, which includes being able to fly in Draenor and the Broken Isles. So that's a must if you want to do any farming at all. Now for a little more technical, I like to get all my specs set up so I can swap on the fly if needed, even at level 10. If you're a class with multiple roles like tank or healer, I certainly make sure that I have both tank and healer roles set up, even if that alt mains DPS and I never plan to use the other two. Speaking of DPS, if it's a DPS only class, I tend to ignore that rule since they don't have other roles available, and I just keep the one DPS spec I want to play set up. 
Of course, the topic I probably should have started with is your UI. It would be wise to get all the UIs on all your alts set up now, preferably right after you've made them so you don't have to think about it later. I have done a series on my own UI, so those links are in the description. And with UI means add-ons. Getting all my add-ons in order before I begin anything is a must for a more pleasant experience. If you're curious about what add-ons I recommend for alt armies specifically, I already did a video on that, linked down in the description as well. I will point out, in light of specs, classes, UIs, and add-ons on your alts, this is when my favorite add-on shines. Action Bar Profile Saver. This one is included in both my alt add-ons and UI videos, so I won't elaborate, but it simply saves your class and spec setups into profiles, including talents and macros, that you can load on other characters. Since I have a lot of alts, this is a serious must-have for me. Major time saver. Okay, that was complicated, so back to something more basic. I also like to pick both ground and flying mounts for all my alts. Simple as that. So I put those on my bars in advance, even if I can't fly yet, since I have designated buttons for those. I think this part's fun. Similarly, I like to mog all my alts as soon as they're level 10, so I can look snazzy. You can do this earlier, but you can mog into anything you want from vanilla to BFA once you hit level 10. Shadowland stuff is 50 plus, most of it anyways, so. Circling back to the topic of garrisons, I forgot to mention that I do also like to get my Mage Tower slash Spirit Lodge to rank 3 and unlock the portals for it. How to do that will be included in the garrison video I plan to do later. And the final item on my list is the one I actually never get around to doing, and that's opening Sunsong Ranch in Pandaria. I don't actually remember how to unlock it, and I'm often too lazy to go look, so if you want a video on the ins and outs on that, let me know, because you and I will both be learning in this scenario. And I think that's everything for this topic that I can remember at the moment. Got anything you want to add? Feel free to share! So, here we are. You've read the title, we're at the stage that usually turns folks away from making or sustaining an alt army the upkeep. This is the part that comes after you've done everything in the previous five parts of this series. This is the part that can be a real turnoff. But don't get discouraged. Remember what I talked about in part one about taking note of what you even want these alts for? That completely affects this step. In fact, it's not really a step at all because it's ever evolving. So let's look into what you may or may not need to do to maintain your alts. So there's many little things that come to mind with upkeep, but I'm going to discuss the three things that will affect you most. Gear, zone access, and expansion system hubs. Okay, gear. I'm sure every one of you has a totally different level of tolerance, experiences, ideas, and goals for this word. So why don't we put those aside for now and look at this with the mindset of practicality. I've divided this category into two levels for you, competitive and non-competitive. We could also call that second one casual, but I'd argue that you could be quite hardcore while not being a competitive player. Anyways, competitive includes raiding, mythic plus, and PvP. These are sources of gear, yes, but they're also scenarios in which you need progressively higher gear to perform. For this category, you'll be taking your alt army through any of these and then outfitting them with what you can get your hands on. Usually, this is so you can get into increasingly challenging content. You may be doing this on a good handful of your alts, but remember it doesn't have to be all of them. You choose which ones you're playing competitively with, and that will dictate who you get geared. If that isn't your thing, don't stress it. That's why we have the non-competitive category. I define this as the comfortably able to solo world content level of gear. If you're not going to play competitive with your alts, then there's no reason to chase down that high level gear for all of them, unless you're into that. In this case, your main gear sources are from world quests, professions, catch-up system gear, or whatever the current character hub gear set is. And by that last one, I mean like covenant sets for an example, which are pretty sweet for fresh alts. Catch-up gear is often introduced in later patches like the .2s and 3s, 
which is the stuff you'll see on a vendor or from rares that is decent item level for that patch. Benthic gear from Najatar, bought for pearls, which was also bind on account gear, is a prime example. Time walking or the dungeon events are also pretty good sources for both categories, so those are good to keep an eye on the calendar for. So now we've got the gearing to find and the main sources located, but how do you really know which one you need to do? Well, that's simple. What content are you planning to use these alts for? Do you want to raid, PvP, or do Mythic Plus? Then get the competitive gear. That's the only place you really need it. If you just plan to farm herbs or skins, old raids, world quests, rares, etc., then you really only need whatever the highest level current world quests or catch-up gear is. In this case, the catch-up gear is really the best of those two, but again, that comes in later patches. Now, you might be squirming in your seat because you've had it drilled into your head that the only way to gear is with raid gear. But answer yourself this. Do you really want to fully raid gear your entire alt army? All of them? No, no, no. You'll go mad with burnout, trust me. If you really want to gear out one to satisfy that itch, then just gear your main. They're not an alt anyway, so this rule doesn't apply to them. Remember, practicality. You just need enough gear on your alts to comfortably do whatever content you're using them for. You don't need to be armored to the teeth to go fight Ragnaros anymore, okay? Alright, so that's gear. The other two points take a lot less explaining. Let's start with zone access. This is exactly what it sounds like. Whatever content is preventing your alt from going into a zone and accessing that zone's content. Some are easy and have skips, some suck hard and don't. I have three examples for you and I'll unironically name them the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good example? The Broken Shore in Legion. Once you've done that intro on at least one character, you can skip the entire thing just by telling Khadgar you've done it at the very beginning. Literally nothing more to do here. You poof into the Broken Shore hub, and now you can quest there or whatever you want. Yay for account-wide unlocks! The bad example. The Colturus and Zandalar intros. These are what I call half-ass skips, to put it bluntly. The majority of the original intro content is skippable. Just talk to Jaina or Nathanos after their little setup and skip the scenarios. Poof, you're there in the zones, but you're not done. You still have to tour the place and get acquainted with it, and then talk to whoever or whatever even though you've done this a gazillion times. Unless you're an allied race, of course. It's not hard, but it gets old and adds up if you have a lot of alts. Okay, now for the ugly example. Najatar in BFA. This zone unlock takes 20 to 30 minutes, and you will have to do it on every single alt. I just did one to get the new footage for this video, and yeah, still no skip. Do you know how many times I have done this intro on alts? Do you know how badly I want to barf out my own lungs? Yeah, very, very ugly example. Now, I'm sure you're like, why the heck in heck would you do Najatar at all your alts? Well, for the same reason I play the game. Collectibles. There are rare mounts, pets, mog, and a lot more that come from that zone, which you can't access without the intro. This goes for any zone that need unlocks. Mechagon and Argus are also prime examples, though they don't have ugly intros like Najatar. If collecting is your main reason for the alt army, then you will want to access all the zones so you can get as many chances in as possible. But of course, that's for you to decide. Alright, now for the final topic. Expansion system hubs. And what do I mean by this? Well, I mean whatever the main system city-like mechanic that expansion is based around. Garrisons for warlords. Glass Halls for Legions, and Covenants for Shadowlands are all good examples. There are more, of course. Now, I want you to look at this not as hurdles or points of pain, but important content that gives you benefits for getting it all set up. And once it's set up, it's done. You can't demolish your garrison, it's there forever. So you don't have to worry about those things decaying over time. Of course, this means you do need to do them on each alt. How much or how little is your call, but in all cases, the more you put in, the more you get out. Here's a prime example. 
Shadowlands Covenants. If you spend some time whizzing through the campaign, which is not required, you get a complete set of armor and get to pick a weapon at the end. Bam, a free set for your scrawby, probably quest geared alt. And guess what? That gear is upgradable too. Plus, it looks pretty great. Nifty, right? So, those are the three main points of upkeep I feel are most going to affect your alts. Now, here's what I recommend you do with all this information I just threw at you. Make list of what you need to do for each alt. Make a gear list so you can check off when they're done and set a consistent item level or a slot goal for each one. Make a zone access list of what they need to unlock, as well as expansion hubs. Sunsong Ranch, Isle of Thunder, Garrisons, Tanan, Legion Class Halls, Argus Broken Shore, Shadowlands Covenants, uh... Bajir is another one I think still requires an intro. There's a healthy list here and a more I'm sure that I'm not remembering. So if you want me to make a video on that list, let me know and I can add it to my list. Ta. Ah. In the case of Covenants, since you have four choices, I'd even make a choice in advance and note down on what Covenant each alt is going with. This will help you both now and in four years when you need to dust off your Necrolord for that last mount. Alright, I think that about does it for upkeep. There's more tiny little things, of course, but these were the topics I felt were most glaring and would certainly affect all of you, no matter what your plans are. So, you've made your alt army, you've got them set up, you understand upkeep, and now you can just reap the benefits. That's what this video is all about. For our final part to this series, let's look at some of the ways an alt army has benefited me over the years to give you some ideas on what you can use them for. Let's dig right into it. First benefit. Increased collectibles chances. It's no secret that a lot of collectible items in this game, like mounts, mog, and pets, are heavily reliant on RNG. A lot of mounts that drop from raids, for example, are in the 1-2% to drop rate. Yuck. Alt armies can have your back here. Rather than getting just one chance at invincible each week, you can get as many as you're willing to stomach. Even if you're unlucky, sheer persistence with an alt army will get you your mount sooner rather than later. Next benefit. Repeated access to character-specific content. That description can apply to a lot of things, but in this case I'm referring to things like Garrisons or Sunsong Ranch. In the case of the Garrison, you can farm things that yield a small amount of materials each day. So what if you did that twice? Or four times? Or eight times? If you're willing to be patient, suddenly you can be swimming in those materials. Paying attention to opportunities that crop up like this early in an expansion can make you a junk of gold real quick. Speaking of gold, alt armies can help with almost all forms of gold making. You get more chances at raw gold from spamming instances. You can have all the professions on hand to craft whatever the market demands. World quests, dailies, emissaries, and callings all can give gold which can be done on each character too. There's a lot of options with this. Another benefit I've found is that with all these alts, I have all the classes at my disposal when I need them. How classes function can change frequently in WoW, and at some point you may want to try one you don't normally play. Whether it's for raiding, PvP, farming, or something else, if you've kept your alt army in line, re-rolling is painless. In that same vein of thinking comes class, race, and faction-specific experiences. There's a lot in this game that you'll miss by only playing one character. Not just that, but sometimes Blizzard sets up the expansion story so that if you really want to see everything, you've got to have alts. With Legion, it's 12 class halls, and Shadowlands, there's four different covenants, which are good examples. And another benefit would be that alts all feed into account-wide systems. Collectibles are the obvious one, but the PvP prestige system is another major one. I'm not much into PvP myself, but thanks to farming PvP mog sets in Legion and BFA across various alts, those points accumulated and I was able to get the rewards tied to that system without too much grinding. So I could be here all day going over specific benefits, but these were the general ones I felt were the easiest to explain. My point is, you can get creative. 
Start looking at things with the eye of an alt-army mastermind, and ask yourself how you can abuse, uh, I mean, a benefit, from something by throwing alts at it a gazillion times. And with that, that concludes this series. I hope you found it helpful and inspiring. However you decide to tackle this, just know that I believe in you. And there we have it. If you think I've missed information, or you want to request I do a specific guide, let me know in the comments below. Even if I don't answer you, I just might add your idea to my list. As always, thank you so much for watching, and remember, it's never too latte. This is the part where I ask you to like, comment, and subscribe. Doing at least one of those gets my videos recommended more. The higher these numbers are, the more YouTube likes me, and that helps me bring you more coffee-fueled content. I thank you so much for any support you choose to give.